If you were to go back beyond the year 1400, and even a little later than that, but we shall arbitrarily draw it at 1400, into Europe, and you were to inquire about anything to do with Christianity, you would have simply Roman Catholicism. That's all. Now, they had problems themselves within such churches. But nevertheless, Roman Catholicism dominated and was the church. That's all they thought about. If you said the church, that's what they would think about. Of course, the church, the little Roman Catholic church, was greatly corrupted. And in time, people within the Roman Catholic church began to be greatly upset at all of the corruption that took place and to make a long story a little shorter of which all of you are aware the reformation began to take place late 1400s especially 1500s and 1600s the idea was to reform to get rid of the impurities immoralities and corruption that was in the Roman Catholic Church seemingly hardly anybody thought about well, if you get rid of all the corruption in a church not authorized by the Bible, you haven't bettered yourself. But few thought about that. There was one man, Ulrich Zwingli. He died rather young, but he had the basic idea of doing only what the New Testament authorizes. He and Martin Luther debated one another because Luther had the viewpoint that you do uh, what is not precisely forbidden which leaves room for doing all sorts of things. So Ingley didn't. If you study his writings, he was really ahead of his time because you would have to come much later than the Reformation in Europe and to the United States to see really a great restoration of the ancient order of things as taught in the New Testament as the Bible's the only rule of faith and practice. And the New Testament is the pattern for living for God. But in the meantime, 1500 up, the various, as would be called nowadays, mainstream denominations formed. As I said, they were all started out, they would reform the church, but they found out they couldn't reform the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church didn't tolerate it. Many of them died, sent to prison, burned at the stake, everything else that you could do to punish people like that. But you end up having different churches founded over a period of a couple hundred years or so. You have Baptist churches, you have Methodist church, and you have Presbyterian church, all of them basically forming out of the beliefs of Luther or of John Calvin of Switzerland. And so as we've come 500 years this direction from that time, then when you speak of Christianity today, the average person is going to think of denominationalism. They find it extremely difficult, if not almost impossible, to think of the church as it appears in the words of the New Testament of Jesus Christ. So I would like to talk with you a little bit about the idea of denominationalism today. It won't be new to a lot of you. But it is necessary to understand the situation we're in. Now we have a much more compounded problem in the last 50 years, especially the last 20, because so many people have removed themselves from any connection with any church naming God and Christ and the Bible. They don't know what they believe. They don't know why they do whatever they do. And many of them aren't going anywhere. But when they think of the church, they think of denominationalism. Drive down 2920, pick any street, road in around the Houston area or any other town and just go counting the different church buildings that are there with different names out on the marquee. That's the way people think of Christianity. They don't understand that if you just take the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke 8, 11, and you preach it, as Paul said, 2 Timothy 4, and it's rightly divided, 2 Timothy 2, 15, handle correctly that that seed of the kingdom will, in honest and good hearts, Luke 8, 15, when understood and obeyed, 
simply bring forth the kingdom of the Lord's church. That's all. It's the seed principle. It's very simple. You have a seed. You plant it. It produces after its kind. You don't plant oak trees hoping to get watermelons. You even hate to use illustration like that because it's so, so common to everybody. But when it comes to having things on earth as God wants them, people seem to forget that. And yet plainly, the Word of God, the Gospel, especially the New Testament, is called the seed of the kingdom. Luke 8, 11. And if you plant the seed of the kingdom, that is, people in honest and good hearts, Luke 8, 15, understand the seed of the kingdom, understand the word, grasp it, and they obey it, they're not a part of some sort of denomination, none whatsoever. They're going to be just citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Members of the church Jesus built. Members of the body of Christ. A denomination is a religious group with a distinct name and doctrine. And it never was meant to be the whole, W-H-O-L-E. They all see themselves as a part of the whole. Not many years ago, we would talk about several hundred denominations. Nowadays, there are thousands of denominational churches in the world. And as I say, usually, in most cases, they don't claim to be the whole church. But each denomination is only a small part of the whole church. And they believe the whole church is really an invisible church. It's universal. And you don't see it. You see individual denominations, but they're the component parts of the one church. That's their concept. You can go down and interview just about anybody. Not all, but most. And ask the Baptists, do you think the Methodists are lost for being Methodists? They're not going to say, yes, they're lost for being Methodists. You ask the Methodists, is a person going to be lost in hell for being a Baptist? He's not going to say he's going to be lost in hell for being a Baptist. And you can go to the Lutherans or various others. Now, there's some that might. I notice I didn't say everyone. But the general, ever since the 1500s, concept of the church has been denominationalism. Therefore, each church makes up the whole. And you're saved by Christ at your own request that He come into your heart. And they call that praying the sinner's prayer, which is nowhere found in the New Testament. And that you then, once you consider yourself saved, however you do that, which is usually some emotional experience, that you attribute most of the time to the Holy Spirit. Then you pick the church of your choice. Whatever it might be. The only guidelines they might give when they do that would be, be sure and pick a Bible-believing church. When Billy Graham was at his peak, he would hold all these crusades throughout the country and throughout the world. And he would preach a lot of good moral sermons from the Bible. But if you would notice, and they're still online, you can go listen to them. He was glad to have all these different people there and all these different churches supporting him. And he would encourage everybody when they responded to what he considered to be decision night, when they wanted to come and tell they calling on Jesus to save them, he would then recommend they go back to whatever church they chose and be an active part of that church. And that brings this to the forefront. They don't believe the church has a thing in the world to do with salvation. And frankly, I don't know how you can go to the Bible and the Bible only. And specifically, if no other place, Acts chapter 2. The day that the Lord's church started. And think that the church has nothing to do with the man's salvation. Does the church save you? No. God saves us through Christ by our belief and obedience of the gospel, the gospel being God's power to save, Romans 1.16. But the saved are by the Lord Himself added to His church, which is His body, Colossians 1 and verse 18, the kingdom of heaven. Now this brings us up 
The Lord said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. C-H-U-R-C-H. That's one church. And he did, Acts chapter 2. It was prophesied of in Isaiah 2, 1 through 4, and Peter, standing up the rest of the apostles on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, quoted from Joel 2, 28 through 32, and said, what's happening here before you? He said it this way, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, any time an inspired man says what's going on right now is what was prophesied almost 600 and some odd years ago, this is that means this is that and doesn't mean anything else. So inspiration settled it for us. The church had been prophesied of, Isaiah 2, 2 and 3, for hundreds of years. Jews knew that. There was no reason to quote Joel 2, 28 through 32. If it wasn't because those Jews knew that, well, you had all these other miracles going on. They said God's behind what's happening here. And when a man who has worked those miracles, something a man cannot do by himself of his own nature, declares that what's taking place, just read Acts 2, is a fulfillment of a prophecy that you knew very well and had known it for all sorts of years, then you better sit up and pay attention and take note of what he said. The church the prophet saw was the church Jesus built and purchased with his own blood. Acts 20 and 28. Now, where he mentioned Matthew 16, 18, and all the way, actually starting 13 going through 18. But you don't have to read a whole lot further into the New Testament when you write a letter written to a church. It's Corinthians, and it's the first epistle to that church. And we see rather quickly that Paul's upset at division that existed among those brethren. It's right in the very beginning of the book, of the chapter, actually. First chapter. Starting in 1 Corinthians uh, 10, but we'll start a little before that, or we'll go a little after 10 in our reading. Paul said to the church there, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now I'll read further. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am a Paul, and I have a Paulus, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Then he asks, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? How difficult is it saying this is the word of God. The Holy Spirit inspired this apostle to write to the church of the Lord in Corinth. And he says plainly, by the authority of Christ, the name of Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Now ask yourself, do denominations all speak the same thing? Have they ever all spoke the same thing? And of course they don't. But yet they all claim to be a part of the one church. They all claim to be Christians. The very concept of denominationalism as applied to the church is just false and sinful. The New Testament church refers to itself scripturally. Now there are several terms. Church of God, and as Romans 16, 16 reads, the church is of Christ, salute you. Whatever term is used in the New Testament by the inspired writers describes a relationship between the Savior and the saved. And since it's inspired word of God, we should feel free to use those terms. The body of Christ, church of Christ, church of God. Those are not the only identifying marks. You can have Church of Christ above the door, but what the people do may not be in harmony with the Lord's will. You can have Church of God above the door, and the people that meet in that building may not do what the New Testament teaches. So there are several different identifying marks, New Testament identifying marks, to help us locate the church. But one of them is it does not uphold denominationalism. It doesn't sanction division as if God is perfectly happy with all of that. So go with me and notice 
some sins further of denominationalism. And the first one is what I just said. It promotes religious division. Jesus prayed that such would not be the case in John 17, 20. Well, there's only one way Jesus' prayer can be answered. It's only when we're willing to unite upon the teachings of God's Word and not on the teachings of men. It's the only way. Now you have to get down and hash those things out, which means you have to get specific. Let's take, for example, at what point is a person saved from his sins by Jesus Christ? Well, most all of those folks are going to say at the moment, they acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and ask Him to come into their heart. Well, all right. If that is the case, then that must be taught in the New Testament. I can't find that in my New Testament. That that's the only thing a person must do. It's just not there. Must one believe in Christ? Indeed so, except you believe that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. John 8, 24. But is that the end of the subject? Or is there more to be said on the matter? And so, after considering the totality of the New Testament on the matter, you see that repentance is required and confession of faith is required. And the thing that actually uh, is involved at the point of your forgiveness is your willingness to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Then, of course, you get in and say, well, I believe people ought to be baptized. They ought to even be buried in water. But they're saved the moment they believe and they are baptized to show an out as an outward sign of inward grace follow the example of Jesus. Okay, is that true? Well, I never find in the New Testament where it teaches such a thing. I do find Peter saying, and he ought to know, 1 Peter 3.21, that baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Romans 6, 3 and 4, Paul wrote the folks who were Christians in Rome and said, you've been buried with your Lord in baptism. He said the same thing to Colossians, in Colossians 2, 12. And he made it very clear to those people becoming Christians on the first Pentecost day when the church was established that as believers you must repent and be baptized to a given end. What? The forgiveness of sins. Well, forgiveness of sins is not placed after belief only. Or belief plus repentance. Our belief plus repentance plus confession. Remission or forgiveness of sins is placed after baptism. Thus, the gospel preacher selected by Jesus when he came to Saul of Tarsus found he was already a believer. Found that by his actions he was a repentant person. He was ready to be baptized because the preacher said, Now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized because your sins have already been forgiven the moment you believed on the road to Damascus doesn't say that. We can only go by what he said. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The action of being baptized is an appeal to the authority of Jesus Christ to save you. It's the only way you can appeal to the authority of Christ to save you. For he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. It was Jesus who said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. Who am I to gain say that? We wouldn't have problems with those if it weren't for denominationalism and 500 years of teaching contrary to the Scriptures and what has upheld all those things. Man-made books and councils and conferences and people personally unwilling to study the Bible for itself as it is, though they, they confess it to be the Word of God. You know, the Lord said in His day and time among the Jews that every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Matthew chapter 15, verse 13. Some people have said, well, yeah, He said that among the Jews. You can't apply that now. That was said in His earthly ministry. When does that principle change? We already know we have the seed principle, Luke 8, 11. And if you don't plant the seed of the kingdom, you might get cuckleburrs. And that's what denominations are for all practical purposes. People say, I, I, I don't like you talking about denominations. When I was a much younger person one time, I'd been preaching just normally, as I always do, wherever I've been, as long as I've lived, and had a business meeting, and one of the fellows raised his hand and said, I want to know why we've been hearing so much preaching on denominationalism. Well, you know, I was sitting there, and I was a preacher. I pretty well thought, hmm, must be talking about me. Because they didn't have anybody else to be talking about denominationalism. 
And my question simply was, <laughs> why not? Are people convinced of the truth of the Bible regarding the oneness of the church? Are they convinced that denominationalism and division that it advocates is acceptable to God? Is there one head of the church over all these different bodies teaching contrary things? Each one of them making a part of the one church? I can't find that in my Bible. And more than that, if you'll study your Bible, you can't find it in yours because it's not there. Denominationalism just simply promotes disunity. I can't think of anything more the devil would like to see. And I'll pause here and say this. We are all upset in the United States, and rightly so, over immorality and all the various kinds of immoral activities that become common, the breakdown of the home and the breakdown of marriage and all those things. And we ought to be concerned about them. You know that. But you know one of the greatest tools in the last 500 years that the devil's had to get people to lose their souls, nominationalism. It'll rival immorality because it allows people to think God's perfectly happy with division. Perfectly happy that we're not of the same mind and the same judgment. But yet if you uphold denominationalism, that's exactly what you're upholding. And the Bible doesn't allow for that. It teaches, therefore, there's nothing in a name. I can't find Methodist Christians, Baptist Christians, Lutheran Christians. I can't find any hyphenated Christians in the Bible. Can you? And I don't know anything about Christianity except I go to the perfect, infallible source book. And if that's not the New Testament, tell me what it is. In Acts 4, verse 12, neither is there salvation any other. For there's none other name given among men, under heaven among men, whereby we must be saved. What is that? Jesus Christ. You want to tell Jesus there's nothing in His name? Just well call Him Satan and be done with it? You mean the same thing when you refer to Jesus as Satan? Since there's nothing in the name. Now, we've got a new little baby born in this congregation. And you look at the name of that little one and walk up there, there's nothing in the name. I think Jezebel's cute. You would like that. <laughs> However, I have heard, because people are so foreign, the Bible is so foreign to them, they're ignorant of the Bible, it's not a part of their life like it used to be. That Because they like the sound of certain words, names, they name their children after some of the Old Testament <laughs> characters that are not so wholesome. Names mean something in the Bible. It may not mean anything to us, but it means something in the Bible. That means it means something to God, and that means we'll be called into accounting on the day of judgment. Philippians 2.10, Paul tells us in that verse that the name of Jesus is so precious and important that everybody's going to bow at the name of Jesus so on the day of judgment. The Lord comes back. Imagine all these atheists. There is no God. Laughing at Jesus and whatever. It's not hard to see that nowadays because people are so blatant in their blasphemy. Someday they'll bow the knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Too late. But there's one Lord. And also Paul said in Ephesians 4, there's one faith. That is, there's one system of faith. There's not many. There's not the Baptist system of faith that leads you to heaven, the Methodist system of faith that leads you to heaven, the Luther system of faith that leads you to heaven, the Assembly of God system of faith that leads you to heaven, the Church of God, whichever one it might be, system of faith that leads you to heaven. That is, letting those systems of faith be those creeds that guide them, which are from the fertile minds of men. You can't find that in your Bible. It's not there. People want to get all huffy and upset about it. Even certain members of the church don't want to think that people in denomination are lost simply because they're a denomination. They are. Denominational is sinful because it teaches their different plans of salvation. We know the gospel is God's power to save, Romans 1.16. That means nothing else is. 
That means I must know that gospel. And I must know the terms of pardon that God's put in it and laid it out for men to believe and do. If we could see denominationalism like some of us, I hope, sees immorality, we'd have a different view of things, wouldn't we? But we don't. We sort of think God will slip in the side door some way. I know He won't. Might as well say God will let the fornicator go into heaven, practicing his fornication. Or the liar can go into heaven, lying. Well, let me ask you this. If you teach a false doctrine, a doctrine contrary to the doctrine of Christ concerning how one is saved and when one is saved, are you a liar or are you a speaker of the truth? If I tell you, you do not have to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ and in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of your sins, you don't have to do that. Am I lying? If it's not a lie, what is it? You see, we have certain limitations or at least little boxes we say, now that's, that's a lie. But we don't realize the others are so much a lie. And the Bible's full of material saying false doctrine is a lie. And it comes from the devil. It's up to us to keep the church the church to know the difference in truth and lies. Denominationalism is a lie. I remember back in the 50s when people thought they were really fighting communism and, and a lot of other folks thought they were going too far to the right. There was a program that came on television. I don't know what network put it on. It's called The Big Lie. Some of you might remember that. The Big Lie came on every week. And it was what was put out about communism. The big lie. Anything that is not of the truth of God is a lie. You don't have to take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. It's not a lie of the truth. Baptism is sprinkling water on somebody. That constitutes baptism. Acceptable to God. How many people are believing that kind of thing and they all think everything's so fine? Well, now, who is on this earth is supposed to set them straight on that? Need a mirror right now. That's who. In Ephesians 1, and 23, Paul tells us that the church and the body are the same, yet the denominational world, talk about that big invisible church made up of the denominations, really will talk about the body of Christ, and they'll say the same thing about it. It's made up of the different denominations. I've already mentioned uh, Ephesians 4 and verse 4. Paul said there is one body. Well, there is, there isn't. The identification of that one body is found in the Scriptures, or it's not. And if you can't know from the Scriptures how to identify that body, how do you even know the Bible's the Word of God? Same faculties and abilities that you have to determine God exists, Christ is deity, in the Bible's the Word of God. Well, the same faculties you're going to use, you study that Bible to find out what the plan of salvation is what the church is in its organization, work, and worship. It's the same mind you'll use to check yourself out to see whether you be in the faith, as Paul said, unless you be reprobate. So Paul must have thought we could each one know by the study of the Scriptures whether we're acceptable to God. Well, if anything goes, what difference does it make? You think homosexuals are going to heaven? No. Well, the government says it's all right. I don't care what the government says. They're not going to heaven. Well, we'll put you in jail. Well, I have a good audience there. That's most of what's there. At least a good part of them. I might not get more than one sermon out. We'd sure try that. You might be surprised just what God can do with men put in jail. If you can remember Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a few people like that. It's when God used them at their best. And we read that and we teach it, but I don't know whether we ever think we should sacrifice enough to get ourselves in such a mess. We're logically forced to conclude that nominationalism will cause men to be lost if they're a part of it and they uphold it. It simply gives people a false hope because it's a man-made way. I might as well say you can be a Jew denying the deity of Christ, denying that He's the Messiah, and go to heaven as I am to say that denominationalism is all right. It's the blind leading the blind. And they're all headed for the ditch, Matthew 15, 14. Why did Paul write what he did in Galatians 1, Galatians 1, 6 through 9? Of those Galatian churches, how quickly they were departing from the faith. 
He said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which I preached unto you. Let him be accursed. The Greek word is cut off. Be anathema. What does God think of teachers of lies? They should be cut off. Well, they're not going to heaven cut off from God. So, over here, somebody says, well, the moment you believe, you're saved. Without any other acts of obedience. Somebody else says, well, I think we'll put repentance on that and then have him saved there. Somebody else says, well, really, it's nothing you do at all. So God just moves directly upon you and saves you because before the world was, He determined you weren't an elect, and so you're saved whether you do anything or not. We're going to study something about that church in the weeks to come, God willing. Because the reason I'm giving this today is to remind us that every denomination exists without God's approval. None of them are upheld by the Word of God. None of them have anybody in them that's saved. We're not talking about babies and folks like that. We're talking about people who are mature and can think and act on their own will by their own choice and so on. And you'll see there are churches that believe whether you really know you're one of the elect or not because God is sovereign, then you're going to be saved whether you find out about it or not. <laughs> Until you get there and you find out, well, I was one of the elect. So all of that's all right. We just say, yeah, they're all right, they're all right. And then what do we do? Well, I'll tell you what would, what would be to do if you really believe all that so. Just stay home and watch ball games. You're just as apt to be saved as anybody else. In fact, if you turn a watching the ball game church into it, you get tax exempt and work it out, and you'll be a church and a denomination, you'll be saved per denomination's own doctrine. You look at the churches out there and you'll see that's about the way they think. The Bible teaches that when we obey the gospel, the Lord will add us to His church that identify marks of it in the New Testament of Christ. There are as many churches acceptable to God as there are Christ's acceptable to God. There are as many New Testaments as there are the one in the Bible. There's only one. It's the only one there is of Christ. Thus we have a problem with the Book of Mormon, Doctrines and Covenants of the Mormons. We have a problem with these other man-made creeds, Methodist disciplines and Baptist manuals and Catholic catechisms. We don't need any of those. They don't set out what the Bible says. If it sets out what it says, you already have the Bible. You don't need that. You just need the Bible. And we can identify the churches I've said several times. Now, I've covered things in general. The main point I want to make today is denominationalism is sin. You practice that, you uphold it, you're going to lose your soul. And that you're just as lost committing religious sin as you are committing immoral sin. A person can be upholding all the morality the Bible has to teach in whatever denomination he's a part of, but be wrong religiously and be lost I would think people in the church being that they are what that means and implies would know that from their own personal in-depth study of the scriptures let me emphasize that personal in-depth study of the scriptures but there ends the problem how much real study of the scriptures are there and how much have we been influenced by the denominational concept of the church. It's a concept you can't find in the scriptures. It's a concept that we repudiate and we attack and we oppose because God does. How do you know that, preacher? Did you hear what I read from the Word of God? You'll read the same way and mean the same way on the judgment as it does right now. So if you're not a child of God, learn how to become one. Learn when you become a child where the Lord puts you. He puts you in His church. And learn that the New Testament of Christ tells us about the church of Christ and thus the identifying marks of the church of Christ. And you can know what you ought to be individually as a Christian to be faithful and with those you fellowship. If you need to obey the gospel, now the time to do it. If as a child of God you sin, we urge you to repent of sins, confess them, pray God for forgiveness. And to be with God right one more time and stay that way and never give it up.
If you're subject then to the Lord's blessed invitation, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.